Um, so um, to avoid, uh, so with removal of binary format, we are facing a problem that all application will immediately opt in into unrecommended behavior. Uh, so uh, these APIs are solving the problem for these users who might not need a binary formatter for their own purposes, um, but are relying on things like clipboard and copy pasting data uh, within their application, for example. Uh, both operations, both clipboard and copy pasting, which uses data objects, are real have certain paths that end up in binary for, formatter serializing uh, and deserializing the payload. So the main, uh, so the goal of our um, new APIs is to um, uh, is, is our <laughs> best effort to uh, help users I'll follow best practices with in serializing uh, untrusted uh, clipboard or copy paste data, and uh, to <clears throat> wait. Sh should we do something about recording? I switched to recording in OBS instead of Teams because it'll give the consistent layout with the live stream. So it is being recorded. You just can't see the record light. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, so, so basically, we are um, we are providing APIs that uh, help users follow best practices uh, working with uh, untrusted uh, data. And uh, uh, we want to allow them to do as much as possible without opting into a uh, binary format for the whole application. And as well as um, taking care of compatibility scenarios where they have to continue using a uh, binary format. Uh, we do have a, a switch that allows uh, people to be fully compatible with the previous behavior and with .NET uh, framework. Um, so um, in uh, .NET 9, we had implemented some changes in clipboard that made um, clipboard operations with um, primitive types or uh, safer by avoiding binary formatter and by so we implemented our own uh, code that reads uh, primitive types directly from the payload um, in uh, these new APIs we um, we are adding a simple way to um, use JSON serialization with uh, uh, in, clip, in, clipboard, in clipboard operations. So uh, I think it will be, will be easy to show the, the new usage in uh, the sample if you scroll down to potential to um, uh, sample code. API usage section. So the first example shows um, a code that, uh, like uh, the legacy, the legacy case, um, where um, users would have set data and get data invocations, uh, both. Uh, requ require opt-in into binary format. So this is uh, the old code. Uh, with the new set of APIs, we are declaring get data, the reader side of, of, of clipboard operations as obsolete. But because uh, users still ca can suppress these warnings, uh, the old code will still be able to run uh, the second example, please scroll down a little bit. 
um, shows what the users are able to do right now with um, manual JSON serialization and deserialization of uh, clipboard payload. Um, basically, they just read a uh, content as a uh, byte array and then deserialize it uh, using either custom or standard JSON serialization. You, you can see said uh, that user first serializes uh, um, to byte array uh, uh, and uh, after getting data, they deserialize the same. Uh, so uh, we are uh, the new APIs that are in that we are introducing make it very simple to do the same uh, round trip with a single line of code. I'll uh, scroll down a little bit. Uh, uh, right, so uh, you can see clipboard uh, set data as JSON and clipboard try get data round trip. Uh, uh, manual serialization and deserialization is removed and done inside our APIs. Um, so uh, this is of uh, the um, the case that we recommend users to migrate to. So our uh, the main recommendation is to use only uh, simple POCO types with uh, primitive fields uh, that are that have a default uh, JSON serializers. Uh, so a user applications has, should uh, replace their uh, live objects with those POCO types uh, for clip, clipboard or um, copy paste transmission and rehydrate uh, those types into their own objects uh, manually or uh, so these mi migration steps are probably pretty involved and sometimes uh, users might not have control over both uh, writer and consumption size, sides. Uh, so we are providing mig migration uh, helper um, APIs that would um, be able to read uh, um, a binary format, but in a more constrained uh, manner following recommended uh, practices. That's the next sample, um, right? So uh, writer side is setting data to some serializable uh, type and the consumer side is able to read all that uh, data using a cu custom uh, resolver. Uh, res ideally, resolver would uh, provide um, a list of allowed types uh, where uh, this resolver would be uh, plugged in into um, serializ serialization binder. Uh, and uh, everything be going through um, binary format would be compared against those types. Also, try get data API uh, have a clear expectation of the type that is going to be returned. Our old APIs that we are proposing to mark as obsolete were returning uh, an object type with the new ones we are providing a generic type so uh, the user is expecting to get the font and uh, internally uh, in this api we are uh, matching a uh, user expected type against the uh, root type of in the ser in the root serialization uh, record of uh, the payload uh, we are not claiming that this is safe, but this method is following the best practices for dealing with binary serialization. Um, okay, um, same, next example shows a drag and drop. 
uh, this for drug uh, drug and drop in win forms is implemented on the level of control. Uh, so each control can be a um, drop target, uh, and um, we had been providing do drug drop method in the past. Now we are providing a helper method do drug drop as JSON, which uh, unpacks uh, the JSON payload into the expected uh, type T. So this 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 API takes generic type as well. Um, and um, so, do drag drop as JSON is a replacement. For, uh, so, it is 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 very similar to clipboard set data as JSON, and it will work on the receiving side with uh, try get data that we looked at previously. Um, I think we should go through uh, through um, the new public surface now. Could you please scroll up? Okay. Um, so um, on now uh, the clipboard type, we um, uh, we uh, have set several set data sorry we have we have a set data method currently and we are adding set data as json with the same parameters as set data has um that's uh, the our new writer uh the new consumption api uh are replacing uh get data uh, method or uh, the so get data method has no information about the expected type you can see it returns an object um we could not uh, improve it so, so um we we want users to just we want we want to discourage users from using it uh, that's why it's marked as obsolete um as a warning um we are using the same absolution id for all absolutions in this proposal um so uh for the new method for new methods we are providing a simpler one uh try get data of t that doesn't have uh, a resolver type and uh, a more complex one with with a resolver uh try try get data will resolve uh, exactly a type t from the payload it will not be able to understand inheritance uh, uh the one without resolver mm. um it will work it, it will work with uh, json data uh, um, as well uh, as long as JSON data contains exactly type T and not any, and, and doesn't use any inheritance. Um, also, all uh, public uh, fields in uh, this uh, type T should be uh, primitive. Uh, um, if a uh, type T has uh, more complex fields or has any inheritance hierarchy, um uh, in the sense that uh payload could contain a derived type um then um um resolver is required so the the purpose of resolver is to be able to read um non-primitive fields and to understand hierarchy again hierarchy is not the recommended recommended way for using a uh, clipboard this is a transitional api um these uh, uh very similar uh changes are applied to other classes that participate in the same scenarios uh the, the next one is a data object so data object is what we are play the, could you please scroll a little bit yeah i think uh, we should talk about clipboard before moving on okay so 
Uh, my first question is, does the try get data of T only work on JSON or does it work for both JSON and binary, sorry, uh, net remoting binary format payloads? Net remoting, uh, yeah, the sample below that I gave work for try get, there was a sample that works without JSON. JSON is just the preferred way we we want to store users too. So once they start using this uh, API on the receiving side, they will be eventually consume, okay. they will so, be able to consume JSON data later when their writer is updated. So it's content sniffing between NRBF and JSON uh, clipboard data. So NRBF is used to sniff uh, what's inside, uh, whether it's uh, um, our, um, special uh, structure that uh, presents uh, JSON content. Uh, then we uh, look at the con uh, wh what's in inside our structure and verify that this is indeed the T that the user wanted. So there are two kinds of sniffing, um, two, two steps in sniffing. Okay. And so, then... Jeremy, like one thing that might reduce your confusion there a little bit is that like binary format is still the format that is used for arbitrary data. Um, just everything is wrapped in those things and we just don't go down the binary format or pass. So we, we put a fake binary formatted type that has the JSON information in it. <laughs> it's, it th 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 there's actually a compat thing there too and we'll talk about that later, but it's necessary to maintain that to maintain any sort of compatibility with existing stuff for strings and ints and all the rest of the, th the things, right? So, um, so I mean, I understand that you do it for strings because that's the existing format. But <clears throat> if you're, let's say, in .NET framework, I'm using set data with my own custom object, then you are encoding it using binary formatter, right? And then. Yes. On the core side, now I call set data as JSON. I mean, presumably you there, I mean you you can't fundamentally create the same payload, right? Or do you? Well, there's the, the there is a very complicated hack that people can do if they want to. So the type that we're putting on there doesn't actually exist. So it'll be part of like the 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 real like low level. If you can use system text JSON in down level platforms, you can get the stuff out because it utilizes binary formatter stuff the i object uh reference and other things so that like if you define said type that doesn't really exist in the framework inside your own stuff then I you see. can actually you can get this stuff off it it's really convoluted and we don't want people to have to do that but there is a way out and that's why that's why no i mean more like scenario wise like so you, you can you can call set data as json on a dotnet core app and then on a dotnet framework app so long you add a reference to system text.json i can just call get data and it will do the right thing it yeah will not as long do as you, immediately well, well, you, you have to define it you have to f manually define a type that matches so we, we've created uh, a thing that so we'll have that sample type it's just gotcha. it's a basically basically a struct with a byte array and that you know the utf8 byte array in it and a method and a method that calls the system text json de deserialize right thing whatever so basically the idea is we could support copy and pasting to .NET Framework without changing .NET Framework's implementation of Clipboard. Correct. Yes. Correct. But it's, so, it requires work on the user side right. to read for, this payload. For, for the JSON one, for sure, right? So there, there's an extra one for that. If you use primitives, it will just work and does right now, right? Without right. using the binary format on our side. So yes, yeah. it'll use binary format or down level, but that's what it uses. So. That makes um, sense to me. That that's that's basically the the uh, compatibility minded hack we do. Because if we change if we change the transport from binary format, then you wouldn't be able to cut and paste with any existing applications without them taking some sort of additional package and change and whatever else. Right. So, so yeah. you you get more secure moving forward by default in down level stuff is still the same way it was. <laughs> right. So yeah. Not caring specifically about the type, but set data as JSON writes onto the clipboard a binary formatted object of type system dot windows dot forms dot I'm totally a JSON wrapper. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
and then that has a string field, which is the payload. And so if somebody so, yeah. writes yeah. that type, except, or, that, or, 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 except yeah. this type is not really defined in Win for right. what what it writes on the clipboard is assemb as assembly name is a fake assembly name, right. so that uh, that net framework application can fake it. <laughs> but if if right. somebody defines the type with the right namespace name in their code, the assembly name would be wrong. Will binary formatter on framework still deserialize it, or do they need to make a specific assembly name? They have to explicitly write uh, our assembly name. I see. They, they, so they, they they could they could they could manually mess with things, but like yeah, they basically so it is convoluted. You you can source generate that right through the comp code dom thing and whatever and create an assembly and right but basically. it's not copy and paste a code splat it's you have to no, no, no. copy There's and paste a whole well, cs project you could copy and paste a code swag that actually goes and generates that assembly i mean we'll have that stuff in there or just manually make that assembly right it's right it's oh, it, it, fair it, enough it, it's convoluted we don't sure it's a ripcord for people if they really want it but like clearly it's not going to be like super easy yeah, it seems like something that we should review separately. But like the from a scenario standpoint, I think it makes sense because that's actually kind of nice that we can support that without doing anything. But that kind of goes into the other questions that are asked in chat. So the set data is JSON right now. You just take a T, and you don't take JSON options. You don't take uh, you know the what is it called the JSON type info stuff we use for source generated ones. But it almost seems like if you have a goal to make it work down level as is then it almost seems like you don't want to give people those knobs because that would make it virtually impossible for the thing to work, right? Because otherwise, how would we... Like, presumably, the the code path that does get data on .NET Framework would just call the binary serializer to deserialize that object. And then that somehow, because it's defined on the user side, then itself somehow does the JSON deserialization, right? But then how does this thing know the settings that you wanted, right? So you would have to do some very weird gymnastics to pass them in there, presumably. So I don't know how that would work. I'm not sure my question makes sense, but... Mm. I, I, I think that you are talking about the same scenario as Jeremy was describing so... It, it it is it, it is it is complicated for that .NET Framework user to right. actually read it. But I mean, more like when you're on the .NET Core side, right? You call set data as JSON. Yeah. And I'm saying if we would add overloads to this method that takes, let's say, JSON serializer options that allows you to add, let's say, a custom converter or set some no, options no. In, to influence the JSON thing, then how would that work on the other side? I guess would it at all, right? And the answer might be no. Um, for some of them, it might not be right, and we'll just have to right. provide guidance on those things. Like, it, it'll be documented as being like for the current one and forward with like some advanced stuff somewhere that says, "Hey, if you really want to do this, here's one way that you could do it." it it's it's not recommended, you know. Like, if you really need to exchange things with other stuff, you should be using the primitives. Like down level, you should be using primitives. Like, you do your own serialization, right? So do a byte or byte something and then do your own thing on both sides, right? You can do a byte array and that will work as so one then, would So would you, ex would you then say set data as JSON is just a convenience API, but not the one you would want people to use if they have non-trivial civilization? The, the, the guidance is like, if you can at all avoid it, I mean, you really should use primitives, right? and use the set of primitives that are supported and we'll include some things along with that like point and rectangle and stuff like that that are common scenarios that are known to be safe right those will just work because we are still putting them in on binary format uh not with the binary formatter but they'll be on there and that's the recommendation and arrays and lists of those things will also work they do right now um and they'll work down level do that sort of thing um, if you have other things, you know, for current platforms and forward, the, like, if you want to add some structure, then you can do a POCO and use the, the, the set, tech, set is JSON method. And like, if you want more complicated than that, you probably shouldn't have more complicated than that <laughs> is, is, is our general guidance. Like, cause like yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the I fundamental problem, with... the, the fundamental yeah, problem we have right now is that like, 
you know the, the so exchange great. sorry the ex <laughs> sorry i told you like i'm i'm struggling because i'm having to use my phone and my computer at the same yeah, time yeah no worries um but uh the, the general recommendation is to not use your own types like that are part of your model as your exchange stuff. It's to actually use exchange data types that are specifically for exchange stuff. So, you know, wrap stuff into POCOs, like don't use inheritance, all this sort of stuff, right? So there's a very, very, very lengthy uh, set of docs for this that are, you know, giving best practices and we'll have analyzers and et cetera. But, you know, again, we really want to push people away from complicated scenarios because the more complicated it gets, the more risky it becomes, you know, and it is still serialization, right? All, all we can guarantee for some of these things is that, like, the exchange of the data is going to be okay. But just like any other serialization stuff, if you put a byte array, like, if you take a byte array, what you do with it, then it's your problem at that point, right? Or yeah. even a string, right? You know, you expect a string to not be modified, you got a problem, right? Yeah, now, so I, will I, I will give you one more caveat here, is that, like, exchange through OLE is not quite as risky as other things, like getting stuff from the net or from a file or something like that, because some, some code somewhere on the machine already has to be running and giving you malicious data, right? Um, it can be anything. <laughs> um, it's in the same privilege level, right, for copy and paste and drag and drop. You can't do complicated things from, like, a elevated, a, a non-elevated to an elevated one, for example. So there are some restrictions that Windows puts on you. Uh, right. But um, still, it is you know, a system-wide resource and it's sort of defense in depth, right? Yeah, so by the way, I don't disagree with anything you're saying. I, to me, it's just the, the, the challenge is always when you say set data as JSON, you're basically saying, yeah, do simple stuff. But then when you, I mean, Eric can attest to that, when you look at what kind of object graphs people serialize with JSON, they, they, like, it's hard to say what's simple, right? Because it's like, well, is an immutable object graph considered simple? Is using immutable types, immutable collections considered simple? Um, is having uh, mutable or init properties considered simple? Right. So, like, there's a degree to which, but like, but basically, what you're saying here is like, what you consider simple is basically whatever we can serialize using system text or JSON with its default settings. Right. Like that. That's more or less your your statement of simplicity. Right. But that's. Um, I, I, I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm just struggling with believing we can hold the line there because once once people use this API, they will say, oh, I'm already 90% there. I just want this other thing that I can do over there. And like, why can't I do my own, you know, my own converter, for example, right? Um, and so well, then the, the, you just go more and more sure, into the there, depth there, of there civilization. Is, again, this doc is going to be extremely long. There is another fall through for this like you can do your own completely custom stuff if you write your own iData object and that's going to be our sort of catch-all when it gets out of this sort of accelerate this optimized pass right to hopefully you know again not make this too complicated for people right, right. you know from the for the for the average user and say like well there's there's multiple rip cords out of here right like asking the average user to write their own iData object is one of the things that we didn't want to do that's the sort of prescription <laughs> that's kind like, of what i'm what i'm getting at it's like i think to me asking people to do that is way harder than saying serialize your shit to jason because i mean people know how to do that it's also something that they do all over the place where they do it in yeah, the yeah, api yeah. backend so if we just say if you manage to take your objects and figure out how to serialize with system text.json you can use it in clipboard i think that would be a fine thing to do and then it's just how do we make sure that um we do that in the way that makes sense. I mean, an alternative design to yours is you don't have that at all, right? You just tell people like you serialize and you just say set data as string. And then the other side, you say get data as string and you throw it into your serializer again, right? Like that's a, uh, but because you have set data as JSON, I think people want, will want to use that one. But that one now has a hard cap of like, oh yeah, you only support what the defaults do, right? If you need anything more than that, 
basically don't call the API, do the manual serialization, right? Yeah, and those, those would be the list of options, right? You know, you can serialize it as a string or a byte array, right? As long as both sides you know about it. There's just, there's some yeah. extra magic here, like with it being in a compatible, you know, in a format that we can understand or the down level stuff can be made to understand. Right. Because the down level, like, so it's just a simple way to do right. this stuff as opposed to making them jump through multiple things like go well do it as do it as string and do it or do it as uh you know where we ha where we have some sort of uh some sort of type information to be doing a preliminary check right right just yeah I, so i don't again i don't have any problem with the api all i'm i guess what i'm asking is like how can we make it so that you don't have this limitation to whatever the defaults are. Like, how would I pass in a converter? And maybe the answer is you take the options. Maybe the answer is you have an ambient static options thing that people can set, like clipboard set, you know, JSON options or whatever, right? <laughs> Which is more like what I, I agree with is the other doing. Jeremy on that one. <laughs> but yeah, he, he gave the thumbs down on the on the static one. But like, I think that we can come back with that again. And like part of right. what we're hoping here, like part of the reason we didn't put some of the stuff, like there was a bunch of discussion around some of these things is like, I'd rather be driven by customer feedback in real scenarios than try to be too predictive, right? You know, and say like, well, we'll add a whole bunch of overloads around things and like based on what we guess that they're going to be doing, you know, based you know, or semi-guessing, right? So I, I think we can iterate yeah. as long as we can iterate on these things. I think that's the way to go is to like go with the simpler thing to begin with, get feedback, and you know add new overloads where we find that that actually meets a real customer need, right? Yeah. So my <clears throat> practical concern with your shape is you said you you at some point want to be uh, trim compatible or trim happier, and while your set data as JSON of T is going to root the type. Uh, in an application trimming profile, I think it will still remove public properties that never get called. So, I it'll, it, I guess it'll delete anything you didn't talk about. Um, so there's well, just the, a, the, the possibility the, of mismatches on the, on the like, reflection writer versus the reflection reader. Well, we we should be able to attribute that right that it retains everything for that T, because uh, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to like not uh, on either the get or the set right to that take a t to like not retain everything because if you don't have everything serialization is probably not going to work or there's a reasonable chance a more than trivial one we put it that way yeah and then just as a you know implementation he can start this so there's going to be the level of um I know that the serialization options themselves are the type uh, for the reflection resolver. They're the they're the type information cache. So if this ends up with a new serialization options every time, it's doing reflection fresh every time. If you don't specify one, I don't remember if it uses a shared cache or not. Um, but the any properties that you've sorry any attributes that you've put on the properties on your type will still manifest that you're using system text JSON as your set data as JSON implementation. So even if you're not taking the, the serialization options to control the specific call, um, you're still you're still doing a lot of system text JSON interop because it does it by magic. Like it is an implementation detail that will permanently leak out. Yes, it will. Which slightly makes me wonder if the best answer of somebody using JSON isn't just serialize it and then write the string or the byte array yourself. But uh, if if we if we're talking about down level stuff, then probably. I mean, we need forward. to be able to identify it as a JSON thing on the other side because it's binary format. I mean, that's that's what the exchange format is right so we have to do something with it if it comes back as string we don't know what it is so the you know the the team of things isn't going to work if we if the the user has to know on the other side they can't ask for if you put it on a string you have to get it off a string right which is 
possible, right? But like you you can't right. like expect magic to happen. I wouldn't is... want magic to happen. This is me wondering oh, yeah, yeah, if the yeah, best yeah, answer yeah, yeah. is do nothing. Sorry. Um, we should still add this structured one. So if you expect a string, it's not going to binary format or evaluate a thing that doesn't look like a string. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I, the try get data of T, I, I think, is good. I'm actually questioning set data as JSON. Of, okay. Is it something that is important enough to accelerate? Or should we just say the recommended practice is you you serialize a thing yourself and write it down as a primitive, such as a byte array or a string. And that's, and then, that's a fair question. And then you I'm, deal with I'm that on the other, other side. I'm open to other opinions. You know, Mo, do you have any on that? Or I, uh, hmm. I so I or, or maybe I Stephen mean, does. <laughs> I mean, we are very early for .NET 10, right? So like, I'm kind of yeah. on your side in terms of let's figure stuff out as we go. The, the, the only concern I have, I guess, is because of the history of system text or JSON where we were very incremental. In some cases that has resulted in what I consider some bit, some amount of Franken design because we didn't quite know the scenario when we designed some other things and then we had to add more and more APIs or more and more, you know, knobs for existing APIs that kind of rendered them obsolete or redundant. And so I kinda of wanna avoid this if we can, but I do appreciate that your stuff is different narrow and also constrained by what dotnet framework can do so i i don't have a very good handle on where that puts us yet i, I i'm not like i said i'm all, i'm more concerned with people you know with getting things out and getting feedback and being driven by actual users saying that this is too difficult so you know, I, I I think I'm okay with not having the JSON having the JSON thing like the extra stuff of the JSON thing in our back pocket. Um, yeah, I mean, to... if having it, I mean the so to I I know I asked if we should have it. I'll, I'll say a reason to have it is people are going to be lazy and not serialize, and they'll just use the binary format of writing because if it continues working, they have no reason to suffer pain telling them to do something different that's a one-line change is probably easier than getting them to do something that's a three-line change. And I, I think in that argument, then probably you're right. Because, I mean, this is the, the general, like, the real thing here is, like, we want to take away surprises. One, like, oh, wow, I took the binary formatter package and I turned on all these scenarios I really wasn't aware of, right? <laughs> Yeah. That's one. So we want it to be we want explicit gestures from everybody and, and things rubbed in their face about when they're going to hit a particular path. Right. And making ex that not a thing anymore where it's like, oh, I had no idea. And, you know, two is like we also want to take away as many. Uh, as many things that cause them to go to that <laughs> as, as we can. Right. So greasing the path there like just making the, the the primitives was one thing it just makes that work if we told people to like figure out a way to do strings and things like that down level right nobody would change it right so um so maybe it is just fair to do that then the, the json thing because like if you tell them all right well go go reference the system text json thing do this thing i mean like it's not just one line anymore it's 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 multiple mm -hmm. You dropped off how many at that point? You know, half, 60, 70 from willing to be doing that. I don't know. This, this is also WinForms customers we're talking about, right? Yeah. So, um, and so for the try get data side, um, so skipping over whether we're adding the whatever the the thing you use for source gen uh, for JSON serialization. Uh, if somebody's currently calling get data, and then they do a, an is a fall, the recommendation is they turn that into a try get data of first type, or try get data of second type, or try get data of third type, uh, etc. Correct. Yes. Because there's no. I'll, I'll, I'll let Tanya take over again. Because if I'll, I'll if they expect the if they expect one of three types, um, I'm just wondering. Uh, again, I'm fine with that being the answer. I'm just questioning the scenario. If they think there would be one of three types that come across the thing, uh, I'm sorry. What three times types? 
Uh, I expect that the thing that's going to be copy and pasted between two instances of my application is a string array or a string or yeah, uh -huh. a third type. Um, okay. So with get data, you get you get that back as object, and then you ask if value is string array, do one thing. Else if mm -hmm. value is string, do another. Else if value is my third thing, go do the third thing. Uh, hopefully you wrote that as else if, eh, or you write a hard cast and it crashes if it's not. Uh, so is it, we expect three calls to try get data, and then the question is how much overhead does try get data have, and are people going to be annoyed that they have to pay that overhead three times now? They will be paying uh, less overhead than uh, if, if it if they called get data three times, it would be a worse overhead, right? Um, so um, uh, the, the new, uh, um, you, you, you use primitive type as a sample. If, if, uh, if they indeed have primitive data, the overhead will be minimal. We are reading primitive data extremely fast. If if uh, they use more complicated type and we do end up in binary formatter in the end, then it will be a real overhead of uh, um, using a binary formatter. However, this will be only the um, successful case, right? On the in the failure case, we will exit immediately after we mismatched uh, the T. So uh, the, the 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 work that will be done in all three cases. Will, will be um, uh, an RBF uh, decoder. So there's there's multiple so options. Oh, sorry. Sorry. There, there's there's a whole bunch of different options for people to like deal with it. Either they do call it three times, they make three different formats if that's possible for them. They can wrap it in a POCO. There's all, all sorts of stuff that they can do to to address that thing. And I don't. I think doing it three times is like. If you're forced to do that because you have some backward compatible thing, then you're, you're probably going to be fine um, because it isn't as bad as it was to, to be looking at that sort of stuff. Um, it is clearly going to cost more because of that, that data has to be gotten multiple times, but it's not the same cost as the binary formatter object was, was uh, to, to be poking at it. So it's not like we're deserializing it to see what it is, right? We have to get the byte stream and parse it with the, the the NRBF decoder, which is actually pretty decent for perf, right? Right, but if it's if it's embedded JSON, do, do you have a custom writing of the type? Yeah, we will read the type from the uh, NRBF decoder data. Uh, so NRBF decoder data will our, our, read our... the magic structure that we manually uh, binary formatted. And from that magic structure, it will read T. So, so it is our still... cost is in matching the T against the requested T. So, so it is still type discriminated deserialization because you've your custom set data is JSON. You're writing down the type that you think it is, and then mm -hmm. you're reading that field in in try get data. Well, we're writing the type yes. it is. I mean, like you're passing the object of T, and we're putting that in there, right? Whatever the T is is going to be in there, and when you get it out, it's got to be that explicit T. Uh, right, um, but when you're reading it, you don't know that that's real, which makes no, it sure. but payload discriminated deserialization. That would be true for, any, true for anything you're deserializing. It's just an extra step, right, that you have to look at. Like, you say it's this, mm -hmm. and ultimately when it comes to the JSON thing, it's a matter of whether or not the thing is going to match, right? So, you know, will this will the stream actually deserialize as a T, right? Right. Um, it, it, it's sort. I mean, in some ways, the binary format is similar to. In the ultimately, the big thing is that like we're not allowing any arbitrary type to be done, right? Right. Now, I mean, you, for yeah. for JSON, there is no real way to constrain it, as far as I know. But maybe there is using the options, and we need to actually pass that in through with the JSON options to force it. To constrain it to that T, I weren't concerned about that with the primitive stuff. I didn't think that that mattered, but I'm just asking clarifying questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to give feedback to it to see. Yeah. 
So, so, so the problem you... with this example will be that uh, the new methods will pay interop uh, overhead. That that's probably the if they have to do it three times, then the interop overhead probably is the worst part. Interop with native clipboard. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm just, is this the recommended, if somebody's doing this kind of thing, which I don't, I don't know if they do, but I could believe it once it's an object-based API, uh, is this the recommended transformation and, uh, or, and, or is there a different API that you would, would suggest like, I mean, I would... the easy thing is you can move to a two or three or four, uh, generic arity overload of try get data which is mm, one of these things I'll write to um, I don't know I, that I recommend that uh, but no I, I I would shy away from that like I would be pushing them to be not doing I guess it's not really polymorphism but like not doing multiple things so again I, 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 I hear what you're saying there and I think we need to pay attention to that I wouldn't start with that I'd like see what the real scenarios are and see how painful right. it is so you'd tell them to, I, you know to just uh, again I, concentrate yeah. on one type and make that one type have whatever variance they wanted yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. Is, the, is the default thing okay. or use different format name yeah fair enough I don't actually know what the format is so I just the, the, form, format. the format is the ID for the clipboard right there's predefined ones and you can make whatever one you want like tech capital t x e x t is one of the existing ones right and unicode and things like that those have their own special formats <clears throat> there's um but anything outside of that is binary format data but that could be any arbitrary string but that is the key so you have to you have to put with that string you have to get with that string so you can check to see if that type is there like you check if data is available you check to see whether that string ID is there. What's in the payload? That's a different story, right? And that's the the T stuff. But mm -hmm. that's that that's the checking that you can do. So like if you split it up into three things, let, let, let's say it's, you know, when you talk about this one, person string or person array string or whatever it happens to be, right? You, you can do three of those, and then you can check for each of those ones in particular, and then you do nothing, right? That's that's just a simple string check against the all the APIs to see whether. There, there's an on i i data object there is data available right or get data available or something like that right so yeah. in so then this means uh your try on the one sense is returning false for two reasons one is the the format returned uh, the format wasn't found on the clipboard uh, mm -hmm. the second right. is it's not the right type now mm -hmm. we can say that those are the same reason of uh there's not that type data available yeah mm -hmm. and, they, and if they really care they can check both right uh does clipboard expose a data exists yeah. boolean yeah yes okay. uh, this is the common usage of, of clipboard uh first to check if uh, the uh, the given format id is present and only then trying to retrieve the, that format that's that's the, okay. that's the that's the regular user gesture yes okay so so this was already considered a mistake in the current thing because they should have used a different format ID for their different sub stream things. Okay. They probably should have. I mean, you didn't have to <laughs> in the, in the current format because it's just magic. We'll get whatever is there. Um, but yeah, you, you should have done multiple ones. Okay. So yeah, I think the answer, so popping to a, a thing from chat, which we discussed a little bit. Uh, I think the answer is you don't want to do it now, but the source generated JSON would require that you took a, a something parameter, JSON type info, JSON have a banana, um, something. Do we do we want to not do those until WinForms is invested more in in trimming and AOT and and all that stuff, or do we want to do it preemptively? Well, I, I would want to see that users are asking for it basically first because, like, we aren't advertising the fact that you can trim for AOT because there's so many ways to fall out of it. You know, data binding is a pretty fundamental part of WinForms apps. So um, I, I would rather not be preemptive 
on things unless we're all like really really sure that it's going to come because there's nothing preventing us from going and adding things based on and feedback that comes in even throughout the cycle protector will be thrown in right off the bat and it starts you know we start depreciating the other apis we're going to get a lot of feedback (laughs) more more than we would normally get we already have this feedback feedback in the proposal yeah and i assume since type name is new we don't already have an existing delegate type that is uh, the same as this funk no and that no. that's one of the, that's one of the meta questions that we have to like you know we we have other like i type resolver things in the framework but like none of them would be appropriate and since type name is something the framework is providing it might be something that we would want to have abstracted behind an interface um in the framework i mean in the libraries is to have an i type resolver that takes type name which we really would kind of want people to be doing encouraging them to use type name and not string right i named them to type I so mean, once you're an interface with one function that's the same as a delegate so mm-hmm. yeah e- either way i don't i'm not you know i'll, I'll take your guidance on that <laughs> um but to encourage people to start doing that it might be better to have have that already wrapped into something that's doing that you know whether it's an interface or a predefined delegate somewhere yeah i mean our general guidance is don't add new delegate types unless you need to okay Uh, there are some caveats but uh, so what's your guidance on the interface thing where you have an interface with one method uh, i mean the general guidance is don't add interfaces unless you understand the consequences of adding interfaces well (laughs) Uh, so I think guidance says that this is your best answer. Uh, All right. So that that there there were a fair amount of questions about this because we don't have many funks that people are used to, right, in the framework. They they exist, but it's not a super common pattern yet, right? You know, we would always right. create a delegate before, and we would always right, create you, some sort of interface because you predate funk. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Not, not not just us, but framework in general. So the yep. question kept getting raised about why are we doing a funk? And it's like, well, because we only have one. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I was like, I just, when glancing at it, I didn't pay attention to the fact that it was the new type name type uh, initially. I was okay. like, really? We're doing a, a, a funk here? There's not an existing type resolver that we can plug into, but since it's based on type name, um, this seems... Right there, there is an existing type resolver APIs. There's a few of them, but none of them match, and they have other inter- they have other methods on them that have no uh, applicability. <laughs> right. Yep. So, yeah. Sorry. Oh. And sorry, Tanya. Back to you. This should actually be type question mark because I assume you return null if you want it to not resolve, or are you supposed to throw? Uh, no, that it is supposed to throw. In fact, if it is returning null, if 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 what user provided returns null, we uh, we have special handling for it and we force uh, a, a, an, an exception. Um, so uh, it, sh- yeah. Basically, this resolver is plugged into serialization binder. Serialization binder should not return null, and uh, that, that's why this is a type, not a type question mark. And once we're talking nullability, I will point out JSON can carry the value null and the JSON serializer can emit the value null. Um, so if we wanted to be super duper picky, these this should be T question mark and this should be T question mark. But if we want to say null doesn't make sense, then that's fine. But this can't be guaranteed unless you want to throw yourself and try to get data. So T is a nullable type, uh, as it is declared right now. Do do I need a question mark in this case? Well, it's if somebody right <clears throat> calls try get data out string and instead of out string question mark, uh, then they will be prompted to. They will uh, be surprised when they can get null. Hmm. Wait, uh, if nullability is enabled, then they will be prompted to write string star, uh, string question mark, I believe. 
Uh, not with your current level of annotations. But no, like C, there's, like, C we, is we a have... nullable type, right? Only if they I said it was a nullable it type. I don't declare it as non-nullable. I don't constrain it as non-nullable. Right. But it's in, so assuming that we that you add the not null if true, or whatever the right level of generic mm -hmm. thing is on here. Uh, if I call try get data of format comma out string stir, nothing's like I can, that just means that the T here is string instead of string question mark. So I've said this is a non-nullable string. You don't actually know that because nullability is a language feature and not a runtime feature. And mm -hmm. if the payload says it is a type system.string but has the JSON value the literal in ULL, then stir you will return true and stir will be null. Because that is so a legal string. What 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 I think that we would be doing here is just kind of trying to match the existing behavior. I don't know if you can actually serialize a null with the binary formatter. I think that is something that is impossible that I work Okay, so you would block I, it I would, and set data to, as like, JSON. We would want to match that behavior and not like start introducing the ability to put nulls in. So we would right. throw if there happens to be one, right? I or mean, take one. Yeah. So it okay. So it, it would still be possible if somebody manually bangs out a, a payload yeah, yeah. to put on the clipboard. Um, but certainly you can throw in set data as JSON if data is null. Yeah, and get it too on the get stuff too. And so on the I get, yeah, again, you could with say the, with the binary formatter, there is no such thing as far as I know. There's like doing a null. I'd have to double check because it's. It's been a, several months since I was deep diving there. Like I, I think that's impossible. But yeah, um, I mean, it has to be able to represent null, otherwise it couldn't call yeah, but not, a, not, but a not remote procedure with not as the not as the root type. Yeah, right. You actually have to have something, right? Fair enough. Um, but yeah, so once but once you move to the JSON wrapper, then um, then null could come out of it, and so you'll need to check that. Get the JSON serializer dot deserialize of string uh, can return null because n u l l is a legal string. All right, so it sounds like we had a lot of discussion on this, but we're leaving the the type as it is. Um, oh, I guess there was a discussion regarding the point of using the same um, diagnostic ID across both copies of clipboard um, did in the chat did we work out whether we actually want to use the winforms diagnostic ID in WPF or if we want to split it to a winforms one and a WPF one okay I'll write it down as a consider the analyzer piece sorry so what you just asked Right, so you're marking uh, get data that returns object as yeah. So like uh, with I, I asked the question there, and that's like kind of a guidance thing, you know. I don't think we have any. <laughs> it just I mean, seems it seems awkward to call something w. You know, you know, use the winforms prefix for something for WPF. It, just just from a a. Uh, formatting perspective. I mean, clearly it doesn't make any technical difference, but um, I mean, to me, there's like, the yeah, there's like two arguments to split it. One of them is if you, if you, I mean, as you said earlier, right, WPF did something one release after we did it in WinForms. So if we do, if we ship it at different points in time, it's certainly nicer to have them separated, um, especially when we expect people to use both technologies at the same time and they may want to suppress them individually. Um, but if the technology is fundamentally shared, I don't think it matters because, I mean, isn't it already the case that WPF has a dependency on WinForms? Yeah. So, like, the implementation we're going to be sharing in, in .NET 10, that's the intent. The the backing, so the, the, the front, the API you're hitting is clearly it has to be, you know, separate types, but you know, all the rest of the code behind it will be factored into shared DLL. They're they're not using much currently directly. It's accessibility is the main thing, you know, the I, I accessible. Um, 
but they're already part of the the flow and everything else and it's all part of the same package right the windows desktop package has the same set of assemblies for as the entire set of assemblies for both right um so you know we when we took system drawing we added a, a, a base assembly for that to share between implementation stuff between system drawing and windows forms system drawing common specifically and we're going to share that now too with with uh, WPF and put stuff like this where the implementation is it literally is a copy right of the WinForm stuff from way back and the interface is exactly the same there's there's very small differences between them they have a dispatcher call that they have to make and stuff like that but yes so now that it's technically possible for us to do it we are going to like not duplicate the code <laughs> And we, we just moved all of our code to to use uh, com wrappers, right? So they're going to get a benefit out of that as well. So they will no longer be using um, the built-in uh, com interrupt for their OLE stuff. I mean, yeah, in terms of like prefix, I mean, the prefix is just mostly meant for us to make sure that the numbers are unique. If we take offense to the to the naming I mean, we can always cook up a new prefix if you feel strongly enough. I mean, we could have one for comment or Rob, for example, right? That would be fine. But also, I think for for people, I don't think it matters that much. I would I would guess because the numbers are meaningless to most people anyway. Like it's just a string that you copy paste and put it. Okay, in then we'll file. we'll keep it as one, and we won't add complexity unless somebody finds a good reason for it. I mean, yeah, because to make it pretty, I don't really care, right? Yeah. So. Um, I mean, the primary reason to have diagnostic IDs is to be able to suppress multiple in one spot. That's really yeah. what it is. So in that sense, it's an opaque string that ideally you know what it means, but it's hard to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair. I just I wanted to ask it because like, right, we're 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 crossing a a boundary here that we haven't hit crossed yet. Fair enough. So. Right, and and we will be able to use different URLs. Uh, for WPF and WinForms was the same idea, I assume. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it'll just, so it's, yeah. Are Will anybody be upset if we have a WF diagnostic ID and a WinForms warnings uh, URL format pop up? and they're building a WPF app. And if the answer is we don't care enough, then one ID seems fine. OK, is there anything else on clipboard before we move on I mean, to the things only that thing are is structurally like, the same? We had a quick discussion in chat. Like the, the only thing I'm thinking of is like, would it make sense instead of putting stuff directly on clipboard is to just have a net new type that would handle that. I mean, I just sketched something as, you know, JSON data object, but it doesn't really matter because if we have a separate type, we can cleanly oop that type, right? We can clearly give people a, an assembly that has a dependency on system text.json that understands the com interrupt APIs because there's a dependency on that as well and can handle the thing transitively, like basically, uh, um, cleanly between .NET Framework and .NET Core, because if you want to use it on .NET Framework, you just install the OOP, and then stuff will just work. We, we, so we, how we, do we do it? For that's the place it started. Like, when I was first thinking about the fact that we needed to do something, I said, well, let's make a JSON data object. Um, I don't think doing this stuff precludes that, but it's an additional step in the people transferring stuff to get back to our original discussion around, like, whether we have the JSON thing as well. We, we want to grease people off of the binary formatter and like changing the changing one API to another one is fairly simple. If you have to make multiple changes, like, oh, I need to go create a data object now and I didn't have to do that before. Um, no, you wouldn't have to create it, right? I mean, the whole point would they be do it for them. You just, instead of calling clipboard dot new API, you would say JSON data object dot set new API, right? Like, it, it's, um, it's just you yeah, change I mean, whether, we, whether oh, you're, you're, you're saying for the back for the backing thing and making it as putting yeah because then because then the so you have two problems of the current design it's like first of all now you add a dependency 
to system text or JSON from bin forms, which you may or may not want. But then there's the other problem is in .NET Framework, you're kind of screwed because you can't do that there, right? So you, you're you mm -hmm. still constrained by what that implementation can handle versus if you just say there's a net new type, you use it on both sides, well, then you make it do whatever you want it to do. You don't, you're not constrained by what .NET Framework can do. Um, it's just a, it's just a, yeah, you know, we, 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 a design we, we, we idea. Could, yeah, we, we, we could create a new, like in general, like I, my, my thing there is I'm not, I, I think we can still see what people do. We don't even, we can still make it opaque on what the other stuff is and like say like, all right, well, this is this, it's an internal implementation detail. Like we don't guarantee that it's going to work for the, you know, for you to be able to extract stuff this way right on framework. Because if we find that this is a real common thing that people really need it, then we can look at doing a new, you know, because that's, that's the only way to make that tolerable right right so we can just consider that when we like provide implementation details right it's like well it's not, let's have implementation details i mean you just choose what the api yeah. surface no no is about the current about be... the current stuff if we if we start advertising like you know take a dependency on the implementation detail of this right to do your framework or down level things then that sort of like makes an unwritten contract or a written one actually in this case i suppose <laughs> we're effectively making a public api even though it's an internal thing right if we're not careful about how we talk about that but then there's also i just can't i, I don't understand it's hard to predict how many people are going to really want to do that right Sure, and, but then and, and how of... many of them would fall out of the just write your own data object and here's the guidance on how to do that, right? Or use string or byte array, right? Yeah, I guess for me the the only concern that I have of the proposal that you have here is it it kind of seems like like I, I, I guess my question is if we if we find out that enough people use JSON and enough people want more options, are we ending up with you know, four or five overloads of set data as JSON on clipboard? Or are we at some point crossing the threshold and saying, screw this, this is the wrong type to do it, and we just basically promote other other technologies? Because then you created one more thing that basically has a cap, and then you still have to move somewhere else. Versus if you just tell people, like, here's the thing to use for, it basically takes an object, it gives you back an iData object implementation somehow, by pure magic, and it handles all of JSON. There's all the JSON overloads in there. You have source generator support. You have, I don't know, JSON still has option support in there. But then, you know, it's basically all you ever wanted with JSON serialization for a data object, right? And then that is now the one-stop shop you can use on both .NET Framework and .NET Core, and we're not stuck with this halfway in between API. Like that's, I mean, I don't mind having an API on Clipboard. It's just, if we don't believe we can grow this to support everything else that JSON does, then I'm concerned that we eventually find out that people want to use it, and then we'd say, okay, sorry, that's the wrong API. Do some do this other thing over there instead, right? If we believe we can grow this to support all the scenarios, that that's fine too. It's just that that I, seems uh, harder to I, do I, on clipboard. I don't know that. Uh, sorry, Lonnie, go ahead. Sorry. So my issue with the JSON data object is when you're copying pasting things from out of process. Uh, OLE like basically erases all the information that it was a JSON data object and it just takes um, whatever was inside the JSON data object which is a byte array or a string and saves that so then on the other side when it's out of process and users ask for it back it will be a string or a byte array and they can't know that that is really a string or if that's a JSON serialized string so that's the issue with that I have with the JSON data object there is wouldn't work well in outer process scenarios. Yeah. But, do you, I, but don't you control the payload? I mean, you get to do no, whatever you it's, want, it, right? It's, it's, it's a byte array. I mean, all, ultimately you're getting an H global. You, you would have to put some extra smarts in there to be able to like crack but, that apart. That would break existing stuff as well, right? That's kind of the... So like all of the existing stuff assumes once it falls out of the 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 known types, right? The text and Unicode, which are predefined by Windows, that it's going to be a binary format stream, right? Um, 
so i mean you'd have to do that do some other things it, w it would be convoluted you'd have to crack it in a way that like you you can't tell just by the data object type because you don't get that right you get you get the com i data object right I guess what I don't understand is like you you literally have that here as well, right? You say set data as JSON with arbitrary T. So how do you know what T that is? We have an internal type that saves the original type, um, and then the by by JSON serialized byte array, and we binary format that, and we look for when well, on the deserialization side we look for that fake assembly, and if it's really R type and then call JSON deserialize with the byte array and the original type. Yeah, maybe I'm using the terminology. Like when I have said in my sample like I data object, I thought that's your, you know, th that's the representation you can use to extract that. But my my point is more like instead of having the smarts live on the clipboard type, you put it on some neutral playing field where you can have it on both sides, right? Meaning dot net framework and .net core, right? But yeah, it, like in my my mind it's it's the same thing. You have some sort of specially encoded stuff. However, you do it today with set data as JSON, right? And you just yeah. you just open it up to say, oh, we can take all the JSON options you ever wanted in this thing because, well, you pass it in basically, right? But um, yeah, I mean, like logically, it should be equivalent. It's just that because it's not on clipboard, you you can take JSON APIs. Wouldn't if Imo's suggested JSON data object, if it implemented com i data object, wouldn't it correctly com? Um, it, it, stuff goes b behind proxies because this is machine wide, right? So it's not, you, you can't really get the original. I mean, yes, you can write your own com to go look at stuff, but like things would have, existing code would have to understand that, like do a, do a query interface and do all this sort of stuff to see that you flagged it with some other interface to see what the thing actually is intended to be. Um, it's, it's convoluted for the down level okay. scenario. I'll, I'll believe com is convoluted. Yeah, it's yeah. not well, asking questions. It, 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 it's not just that it's com like our I data object is actually there is a com i data object. We have a manage i data object. Right. Right. But, that that represents that it's not actually a com interface, but like it abstracts it all behind the data object type. Right, but I see that right. the data we, object type both. extends com i data object, which uh, the the IDL says. Uh, participates with I unknown, meaning it can, it can, polymorphically become back the thing it was supposed to be. Um, with but, a lot of, a lot of like, very comp complicated constraints. Fair enough. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> kind of... just, like which which Lonnie can attest to because she, she just rewrote all this to work with com wrappers. But that's kind of on. why in my API you pass in the T, like you don't you, you don't get a JSON data object of T. You just have to pass in the T at the moment you deserialize, right? So as far as the wire well, format the, goes, you just say you have a you have a com object that just says, I'm a JSON payload, right? And then the only way to read it is by saying, Well, which T would you like to deserialize it in? And what JSON options would you like to use to me to for me to do that? And yes, both sides have to agree, right? If you say on the anchor side, you know, deserialize like serialize with customer, and on the deserialize side, you say employee. Why right? that's not going to work, probably, right? But that's that that I mean, that's the nature of serialization, right? You you just have sure. to agree on you, the thing that you put into the into the com object is a JSON formatted string, and that's all you really have to remember. Everything else. Well, is given you, by you, the call, you have right? to put extra metadata on there, and then like there's probably existing code. Like I'm 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 skeptical that the existing code won't fall over dead because it just goes down the binary formatter path that will try to open it up with the binary formatter. It, it'll be very hard for people to understand what to do with it. Basically, like right yeah, now, it could still, be, it'd still that... be a com object. You're just going to get. I mean, it'd still be a binary formatted object, so you're going to get the same sort of error that you would normally get if you're using existing APIs. Right. So that so that's the one thing that I'm not trying to solve. Right. I'm not I'm not saying you do, uh, you know, JSON data object serialize on the core side and then clipboard set data with that data object and then on the framework side you just say clipboard dot get data. That I, I think will not work. Right. And what I'm saying is, you no, have to agree like on the, both the, sides. But the, you the, have the to error go by you get in that thing, case right? will be un, un, unintelligible. It would be my it would be my concern. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be like clipboard mismatch, right? You you basically ask a format that it doesn't have, right? No, well, it it'll be it'll be you'll get a serialization exception because it won't be a valid binary formatter stream. Um, right. 
So, uh, yeah, I guess. It, yeah, so to be clear, like I'm not trying to be an expert here, right? I, I guess what I'm trying to say. No, 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 sure. No, I understand the, what you're, what you're can saying. We, can can we can we can we push the thing kind of like, I guess, out of the core APIs, right? And then have it so that whatever JSON supports, we can support with this mechanism, right? Well, I, I think I think the right way to go here is to keep the simple one, like that we have, is like to to facilitate the I just make one change thing. And then if we're starting to get feedback that we need more stuff is like to dig hard into that is like, well, what's the better choice, right? Is it to like expand that particular API or provide a more, a richer JSON data object thing, right? That, that does the, that does that with, with all these considerations in mind, right? And then come back and circle back and like talk about the pluses and minuses of both, right. both approaches. Yeah. With, yeah. <clears throat> with Immo straw man, I think it turns into something like that because if you want to push it to the clipboard you still need to call clipboard set data object and if you want to get it yeah, from yeah. the clipboard you have to call clipboard get data object but that yes i mean the one thing that i'd also don't solve is you still need multi-format support right you probably want some sort of tag in it too to say what well, was it an employee or a customer or something right. else right because you might have to support more than one format right so yeah, the... that's why i invented a format parameter for you but yeah i guess something like that right but i think fundamentally like the uh I mean, Jan just suggested instead JSON clipboard. I mean, that might go a bit far, but, but I guess he could do that too. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, it's just... Um, it, yeah. It, I, I don't know. I, I, guess, like, I guess I just don't like the idea that we have a one-way street where we or like, like a street that is definitely going to end, right? That's how I see it. I just don't know whether this API is able to, to grow up to support the rest of JSON. You, you, I think you're more confident in that than I am. If we believe that's the case, then maybe my argument is moot and your proposal is just netwise better because there's fewer moving pieces. Well, it I, just I, makes I, it hard I, on full framework, I guess. Yeah, and, I, and I, again, I think we can iterate on it, like based on the actual feedback that we get back and not, I don't think it's gonna make this, like the existing thing, something that's just unusable, right? Um, so. Yeah is is my point that was that was my biggest concern with it right is like do we put something out there that we're then telling people not to use and i don't think we'll do that you know it's just like yes because our again our recommendation is to not do anything complicated that's our meta thing is like don't do that do something simple do a poco right you know if you have multiple things that you need to do like make one single like is one contained thing like if you have like if you have animal dog cat, right, or something like that, you know, encapsulate that into animal data, right? Yeah, I um, mean, I, I'm I'm kind of smiling because I mean that's how Jason started. Yeah, like you, yeah. You started I, I, off I, I, with I, I saying high performance, simple serializer, no complicated policy, right? No, look at what we have. It's it's yeah. it's as complicated as any other serializer we ever built, and I think. The problem is also your customers are moving away from binary format at the most convenient of them all where shit just works no matter yeah, how complicated the I, 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 under, is. I understand that so like <laughs> it's a... and there, there there's also there's also a a bucket of people that will never ever be able to move off of it because right. you know the if you have runtime design scenarios like if there is no option right because you're yeah. moving actual like controls around through the clipboard and drag and drop and you, you would have to totally go back and rewrite everything from scratch and that's just not plausible for for those people right because right they don't control everything and even if they did the scale of doing something like that would be beyond anybody's capacity to do so i mean the, the projects that people have for windforms things are like million plus line projects right um they're not simple by by any means, and they have dependencies to VB6 DLLs and all sorts of other things, right? It's 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 a very a very legacy thing. <laughs> I understand. Um, so, um, so yeah, yeah. Unless there's more concerns, I suggest we keep moving to see the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, I yeah, think yeah. we have uh, yeah, we yeah. have beaten that horse. All right. Um, 
sorry, uh, back, back to clipboard. Uh, we, we discussed um, absolution ID. We didn't discuss whether we want to obsolete it or not. So our point for obsoleting it is to uh, force users into the pattern that uh, we recommend for uh, reading data from mm -hmm. the clipboard. Um, other any concerns about obsoleting it? Well, as I mentioned in the comment, I'm more worried about the uh, making it not browsable and hiding it for the people who have to actually use it. And that's that that's a fair argument. What what's the what's the advanced behavior do? What's the um, difference between it's never controlled and by a setting in the Visual Studio? And I believe it's by default on for C sharp and off for Visual Basic. For the advanced? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Advanced means hide from VB. Yep. <clears throat> um, so if you write C sharp, you're advanced. I, I, I see two arguments with that, right? The people that need to use it are probably already using it. If people are introducing new things, like, do we want them to fall into that or not? And can we we can always work backwards on that one, right? I mean, what editor browsable just means doesn't show up in IntelliSense. So yeah, 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 yeah. If... But like we, we, we there there's there's nothing there's nothing preventing us from making it more visible. You know, uh, starting with starting with trying to like prevent people from accidentally falling into it. But then again, we do have obsolete on it, which is also going to like encourage you not to use it. Right. So with the with Visual Studio IntelliSense, if it's obsolete, it will show up in the list with in strike through, and if it's EB never, then it won't show up in the list at all. You can still write dot get data, and as soon as you write right. the open parenthesis, it will it will still auto complete the parameters because it's like I don't know why you knew that this was here, but now that you do, I'll tell you what the parameters are. Yeah, um, I, for, I forgot about the strike through thing. Yeah, you mentioned it, but like now I see it. <laughs> I yeah. know it's there, and I, you just kind of overlook it. But yeah, because it's strike through, I would say that's probably good just to not have it. And for don't worry about the browsable thing, because they're getting a pretty strong, okay, a number of strong indications that they shouldn't use it. So you're saying obsolete, yes, but leave it editor browsable for the upgrade and discovery path. Correct, because okay. it's like for those that really need it. The, the things that are completely unbrowsable, and we know people really need it, right? <laughs> Some do. And finding that is, 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 can be more difficult for a, for a uh, WinForms developer. Like, getting through that point, it's like, why isn't it there, right? How often do they hit that to this point? Probably never, right? That's fine. We can always add it in the future if we want it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think anybody has any concern with obsoleting it. Okay. <clears throat> we had obsoleted uh, the uh, APIs that return object from uh, the data object class uh, that we implement, but we had not obsoleted it from the interface. Um, so our assumptions are that um, most you, people who use uh, iData, who, who, who implement iData I object interface base their implementation on our data object class and only overwrite some, some of the methods. Um, so they would get obsoletions uh, automatically from our data object. Um, another uh, uh, another possibility is, is that iData object interface is not necessarily using a uh, binary formatter. So uh, it, it, could, it could be some custom implementation of that is storing data in, in a different way. For example, we have data store for in, in turn, <clears throat> for data object that is not interacting with <clears throat> OLA, which is just a dictionary of data. And <clears throat> that implementation, there's no reason to obsolete that implementation. 
Um, so uh, it, it is a bit of inconsistency that data object class and, and I data object interface don't obsolete uh, methods in the same way. Um, do, do you see any problem here? And another point, um, there was a suggestion to obsolete the whole interface I data object. We cannot practically do it because of uh, how po of how popular it is, and because this interface closely mimics uh, the com interface. So we would have to define pretty much the same um, the same method methods except for the old get get data methods that return an object instead of specific type. Um, so I'm wondering what are if if this if if this approach of obsoleting um, methods on concrete implementation but keeping them on the interface if this approach seems reasonable for you. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff here. Um, I'll start with. <laughs> The adding try get data on the interface seems bad to me because the only way you mm -hmm. can do it is in the dim is call get data, which has already done the full deserialization, and then you reject it because it's the wrong type. So mm -hmm. if you're the binary formatter world, calling i data object dot try get data uh, and then the type doesn't match, you've already done all the side effects of your bad deserialization. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is bad to put on the interface, and the interface just needs to say, this is the problem with defining interfaces. They don't grow. They're dead. Don't use them. Um, so I'll... I, I, I don't know about the... Pre like, that would also prevent them from providing their own idata object if we don't do that. Like if we don't have the interfaces there, then we have to like force people to take data object. There's no way for them to create their own iData object that has completely different behavior. Data object has very specific behavior in it. Like while while you know Tanya did point out that it is like the vast majority of people are just going to derive from data object, right? That's our expectation. <laughs> Um, there's nothing preventing you from doing that. So if you really needed your own custom implementation, there's no way for you to plug into the system and actually get behavior that would be correct. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's true. Your your data object class, you're going to have the same exact problem of try get data has to be written in terms of get data, which means it's you you've added a thing that makes it look like there's maybe more security, but there's not. Well, in in this particular case, yes because they, they still need to be virtual. Yeah, so if you're implementing your own, then, like, that's... Right, that, like, your that, data objects can you, do... But like, the if, I, if my concrete implementation type is data object, then I know that get data should call try get data, otherwise it's backwards, but, like, uh, welcome to the problem of having virtuals. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we accept... We don't accept data object. We accept I data object right into the clipboard and to the drag drop stuff. So uh, that's the reason why we need the auto modify interface is that uh, all clipboard APIs uh, like we had before in the example um, get data object from from the clipboard, right? It returns I data object. And if we want to plug in our data object with our new APIs into clipboard scenarios. This is done through the iData object interface. Do we have any attributes that combine with existing analyzers to say you're inheriting this method from a dim, but you damn well better override it? Um, we are planning to add analyzers that enforce a custom implementation of try get data methods. This is not done yet. This is just Fair work. Uh, yeah, we, 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 we have a big analyzer task follow-up for this to to additionally facilitate people into the right behavior. Yeah. Because I know we haven't done much with DIMS yet, so it's possible we haven't thought of this as a meta thing of just putting a having a standard attribute of like 
do not dim uh, or you know something for hey you inherited a thing from a dim um, please implement it we can do a, a, um, a one-off but yeah if we had an abstract class as our base one here that would have helped <laughs> but you know our, our data object is is actually a concrete one um, that said no, the, the, because this is the one they derive from. So yeah, yeah. We, we 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 painted ourselves into a corner multiple ways here, but you know, such is the life of like stuff that started at the beginning. Yeah. So <laughs> once you're once you're dimming the try get datas, I don't see why you wouldn't also obsolete the get datas. Mm. On I data object. I don't know off the top of my head if an implementer means that they're going to get an obsolete warning for implementing a thing that's obsolete. Um, if they do, they just have to practice yeah. suppress it on that one line. But basically, you want you're saying in the new world, no one should call idata object that get data. And eventually, all things will write try get data, and and try get data will just be the better one. So. I I would expect you to obsolete them on the interface if you're dimming then try get data's in. That's just me. Somebody else can have a different opinion. Thoughts email? I don't know, like to me dims are still in the territory. I'm still scared for them, but like we also never overcome this if we don't do it. <laughs> so I mean, so far we have not seen any problems with it, so I think it's fine. Um, it just means this is another instance where if you ever want to support this on .NET Framework, you're cornering yourself more with design points. Right. Adding a new I try get or I try data object uh, interface, you could put that in a in a sidecar assembly and then .NET Framework could reference the NuGet package and participate. I mean, this is kind of like, I think, something for the WinForms folks to figure out. It's like, you know, knowing that a lot of our customers that are on full framework, like BS comes to mind, uh, are not going to move to core because they can't there's going to be more interrupt between core and non-core processes, right? And so the question is, if we want to facilitate that and we don't want you to use binary formatter, then I think, it, at least for me, it seems to indicate we would want a solution that they can use on both sides. Now, that doesn't mean that the core solution is the same as the Donald framework solution. It's reasonable to say we build something that we think is great on core, and then we figure out later how we do it on Donald framework. Um, and so, which I guess is generally our preference, right? We don't want Franken designs on .NET Core just because of .NET Framework, right? But, you know, equally, I think you want to make sure that you don't build something that is almost impossible to make available as an OOP if you think this, the probability for that is super, super high. Uh, so I, I, I don't know whether this is, makes it worse or better. It's just a point to consider. If we just look at core, we don't consider Ubing. I think, honestly, having them on the interface is fine. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of these other interfaces where you have iData object 2, iData object 3, because that's going to be a pain in the ass. Um, but it's not unreasonable. I think if we want to put it in a secondary interface, I would probably not do the i try data object. I would probably just say iData object 2 and and have from iData object and then add the four new members on it. Because otherwise, you're in this never ending interface battle of which ones to check for and that that's fair i mean jeremy what's your opinion on that like i i i, I know <laughs> nothing is pretty here but like is, do you think idata object 2 is better than idata object and like we can do some additional like presumptions about that right you know like we can add additional logic in our APIs about what you're doing there, right? 
So if you're not actually implementing IDATA object two and you're calling the other thing, then like we can presume that it's not going to be doing what we want it to do, right? And fail if you call the new APIs. So I, I, I think, so if you're call like we're getting an IDATA object, if it doesn't implement IDATA object two, like we, we're we going to presume that like you called the T thing, we can't guarantee it and we would fail. Right, and, and either yeah, and either you make it work or you make it throw. Um, but at least now yeah, you yeah. have the information of the type you're operating on can't or doesn't doesn't expose how to do this safely. I can yeah. only do it post facto. And so I, I I think that because that requires an explicit gesture, that that maybe the right answer there is to do I data object two, mm. or I type or I tape or how about I typed data object. <laughs> How does that sound? I mean, it all depends on how you think about them, right? So if you think of them as, you know, you want everybody who implements IData object to eventually move to IData object two, or at least have some sort of linear relationship in these, like as an inversion set of interfaces, I think you want IData object two. If you think of this as an orthogonal concern that some might want to buy in and some might not, and you don't really need the other methods on it, Honestly, just I data object or I type data object or I JSON data object that doesn't even extend I data object might make more sense, right? That's kind that, of that, enumerable that, versus enumerable of T. That, kind of that, that's what I was thinking. It was just I type data object that does not derive from I data object. You have yeah. to derive. From, you have to derive from both. And if you call the new APIs on on yeah. the clipboard, the the wrapper things, it's like we require that. You know, you have to actually be implementing that thing, not something that you're getting. Yeah, that that's that seems like the smarter choice as far as like consistency from a consumption perspective is because like you'll be well I pass this other thing and like why is it not checking? Why did it do everything right that I did not right. expect? There's there's no filtering at all, right? So filtering doesn't prevent everything, but it's certainly following best practices and we want people to follow the best practices so th that that's what i would go with i mean tanya lonnie do you have any differing opinions to that so to support <laughs> to support i data object two we will have to add apis to clipboard that return i data object two interface now if they are not derived one from the other no it's like you would have to cast to it if you need it Like I don't think people get the data ob the i data object that often, right? Oh and, yeah. And fiddle with it. I I had searched uh, GitHub. That's uh, it, the, this is a pretty common. Um, is it pretty common? Yeah. So we could be somewhat evil about it. Put, put, oh, we could sorry. be somewhat evil about it and put some sort of extension <laughs> on it. But have an have an extension have an extension type that actually like. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll sh we'll have it show up. The, the, I, the, I'm I'm thinking about the other because we're going through. On the consumption side, it's probably fine, but like, actually, for the clipboard, it doesn't matter, right? Because we're if we do an extension thing, that would be fine, and it would always work because the thing we all we always give back data object. Like, well, we we give we give back our data object, but it is uh, isn't it declared as I data object? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, as I'm saying, like th th this would be the hack, right? So, like, if we have an extension thing, so for incoming stuff, if people are passing around their own data, you know, their own I data object, passing one in, right? They need to implement it, right? And we would force that for set data mm -hmm. as JSON. Although, actually, it doesn't matter. So, like, if we're doing set data on the incoming, it, we don't have to check because, like, there is no concern on serializing. the The concern is like outside of set data is JSON, right? It's like it's got a match, and like the T is not going to be there, whatever. Um, but for the try on the on the clipboard API or whatever else. But as far as try get data. Because we always get back out a data object of our own, it's our own wrapper. Mm -hmm. Like, 
then having the having that as a separate API and then like having an extension method. Are you following me, Jeremy? Yeah, but like, it does look like there's a path where you return some sort of data object that is not data object. Like, uh, if it is a data object, but it's not a com object, you return it. Yes, but it has to be. Is which which one are you in there? You are in the clipboard stuff. Yeah. But ultimately, ultimately, when we get that thing, that's if you set it right. So if you set a data object, that's right. So if you called having... clipboard set data object and then clipboard get data object, you'll get your data object back. Yes. Yeah. Which is the time that it's not your data object. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you're 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 in. C2, right? I mean, you haven't left the process in that case. In theory, you're, the data you put up and just got back that hasn't gone anywhere or come back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so yeah, you can certainly add extension methods on that extend iData object and add the try get data that do the, if it's an I typed data object, then return its try get data, otherwise return false or throw a incompatible yep. input exception or you know whatever um, so yeah you can add extension methods on idata object which is different than dimming idata object yeah so that, that that that's my suggestion is a set of extension methods and and i type data object which is an orthogonal thing that actually has that stuff where we can do enforcement between those things okay do you already have do you have a sensible place where those extension methods should live um in the same space that the I mean, we they don't have to live on a class, type. so... Uh, we, yeah, we would we would create a data object extensions class would be the idea. Uh, I mean, the ideal is you name it for its functionality and not just a type with the word extensions on it, but if there's literally no better name than, than foo extensions is. Data extensions? Do we want to just make it more even more generic? <laughs> no, 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 data binding. That sounds like data binding. Uh... It has to be data object. If we say data accept uh, extensions, it doesn't sound like all related. Does it matter that like all things related to data? This is binding of a sort, right? Mm. That like we have like regular data binding or traditional data binding being in the same static class. Do you already like, have a class it, called it, data binding? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not seeing one. Yeah. No. 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 We, we have. No, I'm saying okay. data binding extensions, right? Some static extensions. No, no, no. So the data, data extensions. The recommended for extensions, the fight, despite the fact that there are many types that are called foo extensions, is yeah. name the type as if it's always called in the static form. You would not call it data binding extensions dot try get data. You would call it data binding dot try get data of an idata object cup comma whatever. So the recommendation so, is to not use extensions. The extension suffix should only be used if there's literally no other option. Okay. You should put an extension, yeah, design an extension method for a static invocation and then decide to put the this on the first parameter. Is is the correct way. We don't do and, it often, but it's the correct way. Okay. All of this will change with C# -sharp features coming down the pipe. <laughs> um the uh, Yeah, that's true. Uh, I think for the moment, data object extensions is while we prefer not to do that, that's our best option. And that's also, are, is the iData, so iData object and iType data object, that's going to be duplicated and the data object extensions is also being duplicated? Yes. Although there is a meta question there, like because <laughs> we have so much time left, is you know whether we start creating some sort of shared space, namespace for things for desktop platforms. Sorry, I don't mean to break myself into jail with that, but this is—it's already come up several times, right? Where 
we have stuff that's applicable for Windows platforms across both of them. But we can cross that another day, I suppose. When we start having more than this, I don't think it's yeah. terrible to have two of them. People yes. already have the exact same names for clipboard if they're using both in, in data object, right? In this, in this particular space, they're already having, if you're using both, you have, like, if you're using both the WinForums namespace and the WF namespace, you have to discriminate anyway, right? So the fact that you would still have to do that doesn't change anything. So it's a bridge we don't have to cross, is what I'm saying, yet. Right. So in this example, I take I type data object uh, still has uh, get data methods that return an object. Um, I I would remove them from the new interface completely. That don't. But here returns object. No, no, ah, no. Uh, you 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 mark them as plus. I assume this is plus on. In addition to all no, it's, other, it's, we're in we're we're a diff. We're in a new we're in a new a new. A new this plot, is declaring a, new a completely new type. Yeah. Oh, okay. It doesn't have anything else at all. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's just we're in. You have existing things because you're marking some things as you're putting obsolete on something else. That means we need a diff anchor. So this is diff syntax instead of C sharp syntax. Um, we could break it out into a into a diff block and a non-diff block, but that's what we have. Mm -hmm. So for the new interface, do you want four try-get datas or do you want one? Because really it's just this. Oh, except interfaces um, shouldn't use default parameters. We don't want to uh, advertise the one that takes a uh, resolver as the main go-to method. So I would want at least uh, the one on line 55. So for simple types, we don't need resolver. So well, for if, simple... If, if we don't want... You just... Jeremy, you just said we don't want to do defaults for interfaces. Um, I'm looking at guess. what we wrote down. It may have been don't use defaults if you're doing anything other than null. But uh, I think what we said was for interfaces is the only thing that should ever be defaulted is a uh, um, cancellation token because there's no requirement that the implementer of the interface use the same defaults. Okay. Um, so. so if it's all null, it's fine. Well, it's... But user will still be prompted by IntelliSense to... that there could be yeah, another so it, the, the problem is, if so if we did define this on the interface, and you call it on the interface, then you would understand what the defaults are. But an implementation type could change and in there, when they implement it, uh, they could do that. And now if you happen to have the uh, concrete type, you'll now pass text instead of null and get different behavior. So I, for the interface, it shouldn't be that. So, okay. so never mind. Because, totally about it. because default parameters and in interfaces are of the devil. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, most things with interfaces are of the devil. So. It's also weird to have the out parameter the first one. It was the only non-optional parameter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we like we like the four pull because that's what you already have. Um, and for data object, so for data object where it's a class defaults could be used so do you want the forpl of virtual or do you want to try and collapse it down into fewer virtuals uh the reason we have four virtuals right now is because um this interface already provided uh well three get data methods and we just mimic their parameters yeah but we can do that as we, we can implement those ones explicitly right and just have one right. So I mean, virtual. you have yeah, you have two so choices. Fun. One is, uh, you know, public virtuals with one through four shapes. The other is 
public non-virtuals that dispatch to a virtual protected virtual core method that has ideally one shape. Um, yeah, I, I, I would I would say that like having one method on on uh, one or two is better here because like you could you know mm -hmm. I guess you can combine those and like I, I, that's I true. Mm -hmm. Like if all these two are going to do is pass, you know, like null through. I guess now you need to decorate this as saying it can have a null resolver. Um, but like, you don't need all of them to be virtual, unless there's a reason that somebody could do something more optimal, knowing they called the specific overload. Yeah, and I and it would never actually be a null resolver. It would actually be a, a, a very specific one that only resolves T. Right, yeah. that's the way the current behavior is. So this is probably the right thing is to only have the last one be virtual. Right. So this will still allow. So again, public mm -hmm. public virtual means you can say this format can't be null, um, but a derived type can choose to ignore that, and you can say resolver can't be null, but a derived type can choose to ignore that. Um, if you care and you want argument enforcement. Then you want that, and maybe that maybe it's better to err on the on the level of argument enforcement because we were already talking about the you know trying to encourage people to write things correctly. Yeah, because this pattern means that the protected you know when somebody does protected override. Uh, they don't need to check his format null. You already did. They'll never, ever, ever get a null. And they just get to write the behavior without needing to write the argument handling. Correct. That, I, I'm, I'm happier with that as a, as a choice. And the question is, do we really need, because we have that, we can just have the other stuff be having defaults, right? Or Yeah, so it's just an aesthetics question for what you want for the, the callers. Is Do you want them to see four? Overloads, or do you want them to see um, one with a bunch of defaults? Uh, our guidance, if you do one with a bunch of defaults, would actually be then to still keep this one because it's the only thing with no defaults. Yep. So. So I I, I think uh, I've got your constraints there. I, I yeah. I'm, I'm it, it comes to com collapse those three. Right. So <laughs> it just it comes back to the do you think it becomes weird when you always have to start with your out? And have different order of parameters than the get data. Yeah, so it would be a, a yeah, it'd be a different ordering of the things from get data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. Considerations noted. We'll do whatever's the least painful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is fine. Like you'll still have to test the things in your calling code to prove that they're calling try data core with the arguments you expect, but that Basically, that's where your tests get to end, right? Of yeah, yeah. You write a derived type. You call try get data. It better call try get data core with the the resolver and the format and the auto convert you expect, and then you keep moving on. Yep. So. Okay. Um, Okay, so uh, we didn't answer whether or not we wanted to mark idata object dot get data as obsolete. Uh, I would suggest we do not because if the uh, goal here is to avoid binary serializers, then you don't know if whoever is implementing the interface is actually using the binary serializer or not. So you would be punishing them even if they don't use it. Uh, I mean, it's not just specifically about whether they're using binary serialization. It's whether or not they should be interpreting the data when it's not what the expected return type is. They could be interpreting data based on the format internally in their implementation. On the first para based on the first parameter. It's just so that the, the, you would be implementing i you know the i type data object would be the thing if you don't want those. Mm -hmm. You you would still have to implement i data object, <laughs> right? But yeah, yeah, all right. So so asked and answered. Don't obsolete the members on i data object. And again, we can always add it if we find that that's a pitfall people are falling into. Like it would be helpful based on real world experience.
Okay. Um, is everything uh, else boilerplate summary, or do we need to postpone to a future discussion? Um, the remaining a APIs are uh, wrappers on top of uh, the ones on data object. Uh, like we have helper methods on control or drag drop class for WPF, and we have uh, helper wrappers for, the, uh, for visual basic users who use different way to access uh, uh, singletons in the system. Right. So clipboard proxy looks it's fine to me. We, un just... we understand that's just the same pattern on a new type. Um, we can probably so talk we'll about drag drop really quickly. So. Yep. So. Yep. so talk me so through the drag drop. Drag drop is mostly like a convenience method for users who want to do like JSON serialization on in drag drop scenarios. So without this, they could still do it with the new APIs on data object because we have set data as JSON on data objects. So they could just call, uh, create their data object, call set data object, and then give that data object to the normal uh, drag drop method. But this is just convenience that they can just give us directly the data that they want to JSON serialize. And we kind of do that boilerplate code for them. There's an existing method that's. Sorry, I have to like I have too many things open to work around the the, the issues with. But you know, their existing ones do drag drop right, which just takes object right, Lonnie. Yes. So we don't have that in here, but the point being is that that's easy for them to get to if they want to like do their arbitrary things. I'm just not, so this one says it's only system.windows, so. Yeah. Oh, this, I see, this is the W, this is the WinForms and this is the WPF. Um, I just don't quite see what this is. Oh, there is a do drag drop. Okay, so do drag drop, you just changed it to as JSON of T. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then forms control. To drag uh, and so the same thing here of you have a you have these two overloads of do drag drop on WinForms control and you've added as JSON of T and changed the data from object to T yep all right um, are there still people here there are still people here any final comments uh one more piece of api is way below is uh the configuration switch that we are adding that controls um when uh, when um consumption side apis yeah this one uh go into uh, deserialization right uh so question here is do we want to have two different switches one for wpf and one for winforms and another question uh what your thoughts on the naming of this switch so th this is um, to avoid surprises uh, from the user whether they are they actually end up in binary format or not when they're doing clipboard operations so we are suggesting so we removed um we are suggesting sing single switch for both scenarios and um and the name is uh, very generic with no no namespace to indicate that it's applicable to all clipboards in that net um, um when you say switch do you mean app context yeah app yes. context. okay um have we stopped prefixing things so we, no. we removed this prefix want... of the namespace prefix in order to indicate that this one applies to both winforms and wpf namespaces okay but we, we can say windows desktop or something to begin with for things that are meant to be well yeah we're provoked. basically looking feedback on naming as well as on functionality in terms of whether it's 
applicable to both or we need individual one for each um, each uh, technology. Uh, Mo, you're up. <laughs> I, I think honestly, like it, to me, this is one of those things where it kind of more depends on what you want the outcome to be rather than whether what's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, I mean, if you if you think of them as separate things, then keep it separate. If you think of them as the same, then keep it keep them the same. Okay, then we'll start with the same and see what feedback right. we are. Getting. I mean, if they're the same, though, the question is like this: this would be the first. Like, I think we stopped doing switch dot as the prefix because it was everything was when everything does it. Why does it matter? Yeah. Um, but this is the first scopeless setting that I think I've ever seen us add. So it's, well, are we okay with we... that being the scope or do we want to put Windows desktop dot or do we want to put, do we just want to say the easiest thing is we just split it into two settings, one's read by WPF and one's read by WinForms and then we understand how to call app context. Well, we do have shared code, so. Fair enough. Um, or we will be having shared code. I mean, there's only one clipboard in the system, so. Realistically, yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, so system dot Windows dot clipboard, Microsoft dot Win thirty two dot clipboard, um, okay. Uh, Windows desktop, or or do you think that this is a fine full string of the setting? I mean, Windows clipboard might be the best way because that's neutral and still specific. So I mean. You could imagine iOS and Android having different things, right? But mm -hmm. so Windows dot clipboard drag drop enable binary yeah. formatter serialization. Yeah, that seems reasonable. It's 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 OLE, although we mm. decided not to say OLE because it's going to like clipboard drag drop is the only way people are going to be able to intuit that. Right? Yeah. even though it's not, yeah. Well, this is technically correct, right? So it's the best kind of Yes. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, I think. I would agree with that. All right, meta notes. Uh, we didn't add overloads for JSON serialization options or the um, the source generated version thereof. Um, we decided one diagnostic ID is fine. Um, obsolete, yes. EB never no. We didn't add dims. We added a new type. I type data object. We added extension methods to make it easier to use them and uh, we left the existing interface alone and we put windows dot in front of things do you need to add the i type data object into to implement the you know for the data object class oh uh, oh saying that data object will now data object now yeah. adds yeah There we go. Oh, and is everybody happy with uh, the this parameter data object? Yeah, sure. Cool. Stuff you don't see very often. Yep. It was something I wrote down and wasn't well, put in front of people's yeah. faces. So. Oh, is it supposed to be i data object, or is it supposed to be i data object, or i type data object? It's supposed to be iData object because we're going to check right. whether it's castable and then throw. Did we call that out? Like, or you don't care what we do as long as we like are consistent. Uh, you right. you probably should throw because a try method should return false for only one set of recoverable action, 
and yep. you're using that for the T is wrong, not the data object and, didn't know and, how to and answer. And we're, we're throwing in the other cases too because it needs to be actionable, right? So the other try is not like, oh, if you try to get the wrong T, it'll throw. Yeah, so the, the, the answer for the try is imagine what somebody writes in the false. And if they needed to know, or if, if the, it returned false, and if they need to know more data, then you shouldn't have returned false. Okay. Um, so it's one handler, which means you should be able to describe it as one problem. And anything that's not that one problem needs to throw. It sounds to me in this case like data object extensions try get data of T will throw if the I data object is not an I typed data object. And it would be the same for the other things when it's not the right T. The format would be the false case, right? Uh, so you asked for you asked for a format that's like that right. is not the they're not available. Right. There, the there's no substream named this, which means it's not of that type. Um, as opposed Wait, to like, um, I'm sorry, I can't ask the question. So we have two two cases. We have a case when we could not um, deserialize uh, content. And we throw because we hit unrecognized types. And we have a case when we return false because T is not what's in the payload. We were able to to uh, NRBF decode payload and look at the root record, yeah. and T is not uh, the T. Right. So in this case, I'm returning false. Right. I think. Yeah. I think Save the format, kind the of. format is missing. Returning false mm -hmm. kind of makes sense. Uh, unfortunately, you can't really tell the difference between it was the wrong type and it didn't exist, but if your belief is every format should only have one associated type, then they're the same thing. Uh, so and, and you, the and substream's not found, time. the type is wrong, both of those are false. Yep. Uh, the, t the value did not deserialize is obviously an exception, and then the data object was not one you could query is also an exception, including if they pass null, which yep. can happen. Um, so. I think that's a reasonable truth table. Yep. I agree. And then all you have to do is dock that. Uh, if it returns two, true, two Jeremy's agree. if the format exists and the value was the same type. Returns false mm -hmm. if the format mm -hmm. doesn't mm -hmm. exist or the value was the wrong type. Throws a bunch of reasons. Mm -hmm. Two of two Jeremy's agree. All right. That's consensus. Yep. All right. I Any... do want to point out that this proposal changes WPF API and it has not been posted into WPF uh, repo. And you're asking questions about if people get, I don't know, offended with um, shared code, but there is no one from the WPF team. Um, the... So I think it would be it's... helpful in the future if um, changes to WPF are also published at the WPF repo for the community there to be able to comment I, I agree we should have put an issue there we, we were talking with the wpf team about this and we met with them that was a follow-up thing that we didn't make explicit to them that would have been a good idea it should be a good idea so clear clearly we should have involved like looped the community in as well as as well as the internal team yeah. more more explicitly thank and, you for pointing that out and any changes that they want in the WPF versions can just come as a different proposal. This just basically sets it up as pre-approval. Thank you. Uh, what do you mean by pre-approval? Uh, do they have once uh, clipboard implementation and is merged into WPF? Do they need another quick well, review? No, no, we don't need another review. Only if we change any like right. whenever mm -hmm. whenever something is approved for the API, like. That doesn't mean we can never change it between now and shipping, right? If we have additional considerations that come in, then we can, can bring it back to API review to get changes made. Right. Like if WPF says they want their own diagnostic ID, we come back and debate it again. If WPF mm -hmm. says they want a different shape of their copy of data object, then we debate that again. But as long as they want exactly what we said here, then they don't need to come back. Mm -hmm. All right. It's a hard time for, for India to be participating in this. Yep. Well, turns out there's no time that works for India slash Australia uh, slash anywhere in the U.S. slash Europe. Um, because by definition, one of those three sets of people want to be asleep. So. Yes. 
All right. Well, we made few. The biggest structural change we made was instead of dims, we made a new interface. So we have the option of um, sidecarring this back to .NET Framework. And um, I think Mo's overall point is you should really think about the .NET Framework scenario because it's probably going. It will only become more relevant as time goes on because this is the clipboard and it's how you pass data between processes. Yep. So um, with that, I think we have hit a reasonably good place and um, everybody who's in Pacific time now gets to go enjoy lunch. So thank you all. And, Thanks everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you. For people who are watching this video on YouTube, uh, we're sorry we couldn't stream. We ran into some difficult technical difficulties. We hope to be back online uh, next week at our same .NET time on our same .NET channel. Auf Wiedersehen.